Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is May the 4th, 2021. Let's talk about a major player in the heavyweight division who just won his recent fight over Chris Ariola. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just say, style-wise, Andy Ruiz is unique in the heavyweight division, right? I believe right now he has some high action, crowd-pleasing, career-defining fights ahead of him if he wants them against former champion Deontay Wilder against Derek Chisora in a fight that, quite frankly, for the first half of the fight, would be jaw-dropping. I believe he is too fast and too aggressive for Alexander Usyk at heavyweight. In other words, Usyk would have to be on his bike, and he'd be dealing with a much faster-handed opponent than Derek Chisora, right? And of course, let's face it too, Anthony Joshua has unfinished business with Andy Ruiz. Officially, the ledger is one win apiece, right? If Anthony Joshua is like Ali, he's going to want that third fight. Now let's talk about Andy's style. The best way I can do it is by discussing the differences between Two of the best to lace them up. Ray Leonard from my generation and Floyd Mayweather from a later generation. Let's talk about Mayweather's style. Mayweather's what I call a pot shotter. He wants to set up that one crisp counter. He's cautious. He prefers it to be a counter rather than a lead. He wants you to be exposed. He wants you to throw a punch so you're open for his counter. He also doesn't want to open up himself. So, his left hook is one of his weapons of choice. It allows him to throw the hook while continuing to have his head tucked behind his shoulder and his right arm up blocking anything coming back. He also can lead with a straight right hand, but understand, he likes to move when he's throwing that right hand. He doesn't want to define a pocket when he's throwing the right hand. A one-two is about as extended a combination as Mayweather will get into when his opponent is fully rested and not dazed and confused. Now understand, pot shotting has been the dominant paradigm in the heavyweight division. Since Vladimir Klitschko grabbed a hold of the division several years ago. So that Klitschko-Tyson Fury fight, in my opinion, was a watershed moment for the heavyweight division because Fury was bringing back to the division movement, right? Fury wasn't standing still trying to throw a one-two, right? Trying to counter you. He wasn't throwing a stationary jab. He was throwing a mobile jab. He was forcing you to deal with his volume, right? Very different than Vladimir Klitschko's style. Where Klitschko was bigger than most heavyweights when he bursts on the scene, right? I understand Lennox Lewis was big. I understand his brother Vitaly was big. But most of Vladimir Klitschko's fights featured Klitschko, quite frankly, being bigger than an opponent. We take for granted now Anthony Joshua's size. 
right? Understand, Joshua Fury Wilder historically are huge height-wise for the heavyweight division, right? So understand, Vladimir Klitschko was typically bigger than an opponent. He had a great jab, but understand, he was tethered to the canvas when he was throwing that jab. That jab was to bludgeon you as you tried to get close to him. Understand, his combinations were really of the jab, oh, here's a right hand. That's really the extent of his combinations. Vladimir Klitschko, like Ali, did not go to the body that often. Right, the way he beats Kubrat Pulev when Pulev was younger and in his prime is he throws off the punch pattern and leads with a left hook. Right, but understand that's a far cry from where the heavyweight division was back in the, let's say, Ali slash Larry Holmes era. Where, you know, Larry Holmes gets drilled by Ernie Shavers, hits the canvas, gets up, and his idea of surviving was to get up on his toes and move behind a jab. There's a moment in the heavyweight division where every fighter had a back foot game. Tony Tubbs, Tony Tucker, Larry Holmes. Right? All of these heavyweights could get up on their toes and move. Don't get me wrong. The heavyweight division always had sluggers. Right? Ron Lyle, Ken Norton, George Foreman. Right? They always had sluggers. But they threw more punches than the Vladimir Klitschko heavyweights. Just look at Foreman throwing punches in a losing fight against Ali in the Rumble in the Jungle. Right? It's when Vladimir Klitschko hits the scene that the punch total, in my opinion, drops in the heavyweight division. Well, let me just say, Ray Leonard, by contrast, was very different. He's a much bigger risk taker than Floyd Mayweather. Much bigger. Understand, he was what I call a combination puncher. He's not just trying to hit you with the crisp counter. He's not relying on a one-two. No, this is a guy who would open himself up with both hands and throw four five, six, seven punch combinations. Even against Marvin Hagler, and Ray had been out of the ring for years, and he's in with a great champion who defined the middleweight division in the 1980s. Even against Marvin Hagler. With seconds left in each round, right? Ray would come alive with 30 seconds left in each round. Ray would let his hands go. Right? He's literally throwing both hands. Not a one-two. Not a jab right hand. Right? He wasn't channeling Vladimir Klitschko or Deontay Wilder today. No, this is a different makeup. This is a guy who's letting both hands go. Right? And understand. I'm not talking about a pity patter like Joe Calzaghe has been accused of. I'm talking about a guy who was a much heavier puncher than Floyd Mayweather. Don't believe me? Just look at the KO percentage on Ray Leonard, career. Just consider the fact that Ray Leonard wins the middleweight championship. We're already at a heavier weight than Floyd's ever been. He wins the middleweight championship 
against Marvelous Marvin Hagler. He wins the light heavyweight championship against Donnie Lalonde. And just to understand, when you look at the Lalonde fight, and Ray was in significant danger in that fight, hits the canvas, is hurt. When Ray opens up and drops Lalonde, right, understand, that's a guy who had fought at Welter, who has the punching power to close the show at light heavyweight. So think about a guy who hits like Canelo, right? Heavy puncher, who's faster than Canelo. I mean much faster than Canelo. And who's more aggressive. That's who Ray Leonard was. I think millennials look at Ray and understand people's personality changes over their lives, right? I remember George Foreman before he was selling grills. Foreman was downright scary. Now Foreman's jovial, he's happy, he's, you know, that's what getting money. And that's what having children and getting older and realizing that you're no longer the angry young guy in your 20s, upset at the world, you're now, you know, Uncle George or Grandfather George, right? Or Daddy George. Well, let me just tell you, Ray Leonard today is soft-spoken, right? Ray, Ray Leonard today is an ambassador for the sport. He's low-key. Understand, if you were alive in the late 70s, early 80s, you knew. Ray Leonard as someone else. I encourage people to watch his fight, his first fight against Thomas the Hitman Hearns. Right? Hearns messes up Ray's eye. Hearns is winning on the scorecards. Ray Leonard has to dig deep. Ray goes for the stoppage and gets it. Now, it's important because, understand, Andy Ruiz, in this pot shotter climate, right, think Joshua, who Ruiz has already proven to us, he's faster handed than. Think Deontay Wilder, right, just to understand, in this pot shotter era where some pot shotters are the biggest names in the heavyweight division. Andy Ruiz has the edge on hand speed, and he's a combination puncher. He's like Ray Leonard. Right? He's the guy who comes in blazing with both hands. Not pity patting. No, he's throwing hard shots. Now, what I want people to understand is that there's a challenge that combination punchers face. And it's existential. In other words, you're a combination puncher and you understand that if you're in the pocket throwing both hands in a combination, you have no hands left over to block punches. So, in an earlier generation, Rocky Graziano, many of you are saying, who, who? Rocky Graziano drops combination puncher Sugar Ray Robinson, mm -hmm. right? Robinson gets off the canvas, makes him pay dearly. But just to understand, this is a trend with combination punchers. You're watching a fight, the combination puncher is on fire looking good. Then they get hit with a shot and there isn't a hand up. They go down. So Ray Leonard in the Hearns rematch hits the canvas twice. Twice. Right? Let me just add the scoring of that rematch is an absolute travesty for the boxing historian crowd. But 
just understand that combination punchers can literally get blown off their feet because they're in there in the middle of a four, five, six punch combination and the other guy's firing back. So Andy gets dropped by Anthony Joshua in the third round of their first fight. Here, Andy is cooking. He's backing Chris Ariola up. He gets dropped in the second round. Now let's stop the cover-up. I've heard Andy's post-fight remarks. I've read other articles on this fight. Let's stop the cover-up. Andy is badly hurt. You know that because Andy's getting shelled in the third round. Somebody explained to me how Andy could take the punches that he took in the second round where he hits the canvas against Ariola. He has to take a knee. And in the third round where he is dazed multiple times, somebody's going to have to explain the scoring of this fight to me. Let's just say this is one of those weekends where Derek Chisora has a legitimate beef on the scoring in his fight. And Chris Ariola has to wonder what fight the judges saw. Don't get me wrong. I had Andy winning this fight by a few rounds. But you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you got to be kidding me with these scorecards. Anyway, let me just say this. I thought Ariola looked great early. Just like Derek Chisora looked great early. Right? I thought Ariola, who's 40, tried to hold his own against Andy. Here's the problem. Andy's faster, hand speed wise, than Chris Ariola, right? Andy also is shorter, can fight lower than Chris Ariola. So Chris Ariola couldn't really reach Andy's body on punches. Whereas Andy made it a point to go to Chris Ariola's body on punches. So Andy's landing a lot of body shots against a 40-year-old. Meanwhile, Ariola's unable to land body shots against a guy who's almost 10 years younger. So Ariola on stamina starts to fade the second half of the fight. But understand, the fight's still somewhat competitive until Ariola hurts his left shoulder. Now this is a generational thing. Ariola is not going to complain about the shoulder. He doesn't want to give excuses on his loss. Right? Also, it's a political thing. You can complain about your shoulder when you're in your 20s. People will say, oh, we had a shoulder problem. When you're 40 years old and you're hoping for more fights, you don't want to sound like you have a big shoulder problem. Because people will then doubt your efficacy in future fights. So Chris Ariola is downplaying the left shoulder problem. Understand, when one hand is not what it was, when one hand is injured, and you're in against a two-handed combination puncher like Andy Ruiz, folks, you're in trouble. So Ruiz, like Joseph Parker, wins the later rounds in this fight. Goes on to a victory in this fight. Right? Just understand that Ruiz, if he can solve, and it's an if, the foot speed gap, and there is a gap, in my opinion, between him and Anthony Joshua. And if he can find a way to get inside and dodge Joshua's jab on the way in, and to bounce a little bit as he throws his combinations, in other words, he can't be stationary. As he's throwing a combination, he has to bounce a little bit. That's one of the secrets to Ray Leonard. Then Andy Ruiz will always be a problem for Anthony Joshua because Joshua will never be able to match him in hand speed. 
right? Understand, Joshua is around 30 years old. Joshua is not defensively blessed. To beat Andy Ruiz, Joshua has to be on the move a little himself. And because Joshua is blessed with heavy punches, he hasn't developed the skill where he's defensive and moving while setting up big shots. That's not his A game. I do believe Tyson Fury would beat Joshua just because, excuse me, would beat, well, he'll beat Joshua, but I believe he would beat Andy Ruiz just based on a length game. In other words, Fury can move behind a jab. Fury 6-9. Fury would be able to stick the jab and move. Ruiz wouldn't be able to get close to Fury for at least the first half of the fight. Fury would have a huge lead to bank on. Let's also be real here too. Fury actually has inside the pocket skills. We saw that in both fights against Derek Chisora. So if Andy does get in the pocket and tries to go to Fury's pocket, Fury's going to know how to bend over, how to play defense, how to grab Andy Ruiz. Fury's boxing IQ is advanced. But understand, outside of Tyson Fury, who I think beats Andy Ruiz, Everyone else at heavyweight is vulnerable. Quite frankly, Deontay Wilder made some idiotic statements, in my opinion. I'm just talking for myself. I thought they were downright idiotic. When he was claiming that his trainer, Bart Breland, somehow wanted him to lose that fight to Tyson Fury, you got to be kidding me. Right? His, his corner sabotaged him. Folks, let's get real. You're a trainer of a guy making millions of dollars in title matches. Why would you want to kill the Golden Goose? Understand, if your fighter is making a boatload of money, you're making a boatload of money. Think about all the prestige, the adulation that Mark Breland received from being the trainer for Tyson Fury. Excuse me, for Deontay Wilder. Well, let's just say one of the troubling things with the whole wilder Breland situation are the revelations. Right now, Breland has said, look, you know, there were too many guys in my fighter's ear. My fighter wouldn't listen to me. Our training wasn't as focused as it should have been. You also have Wilder making some comments that, quite frankly, have you questioning his toughness. Right? We're hearing that he lost his legs because his costume was 40 pounds as he entered the ring. Well, whose idea was the costume? That wasn't his opponent's idea. That's a self-inflicted wound. Also, is Wilder, who was unbeaten at the time, telling you that his margin of dominance is so thin that when he enters the ring because of this costume, when he enters the ring, he had lost any advantage he had in the fight. Also, which one is it? Did you lose the fight because your costume was too heavy? Or because your corner was sabotaging you. Right? A fighter with too many excuses doesn't have a real explanation. Right? So let's just say I would question Deontay Wilder's mental preparedness for a big fight against someone as tough as Andy Ruiz. If Ruiz is the opponent that Wilder chooses to get in the ring with. But more importantly, Wilder strikes me as one-handed. Now who knows, that one hand might be enough. 
right? Right hand. Chris Ariola just dropped Andy Ruiz with a right hand in the second round of this fight. Right? But to me, Ruiz is too fast. He can fight too low. He's too two-handed. If Andy, in against Wilder, who's not a mover, right? Wilder has the capability to move. I saw him move in the first Remains to Vern fight. But Wilder's one of these guys who wants to duke it out with you. Doesn't want to be seen moving away from you. So if Wilder stands his ground and if Andy can just come in with enough defense to block that right hand, if Andy gets deep in the pocket, Wilder's not going to be able to find his body. Wilder's not going to be able to match his hand speed. Wilder's not defensively blessed, right? The problem with being a knockout artist is you don't expect the bullets to come back at you. Let's talk about Alexander Usyk. Now, I'm much more bullish on Usyk than most. I believe Usyk would give Tyson Fury one of his tougher fights. I think Fury has a problem with agile guys who can move, who are highly skilled. Right? He got dropped by Steve Cunningham. I thought one of the secrets to the Otto Wallen fight is Wallen is one of the better athletes in the heavyweight division. I thought Fury had a problem with Otto Wallen's athleticism. Usyk, even though he's in his 30s, is very agile. I think Usyk, matchup-wise, and Styles make fights, would give Tyson Fury a hard time. But you saw Usyk, like Joseph Parker, have a hell of a hard time. Staying away from Derek Chisora. Right now, Chisora has foot speed that Andy Ruiz does not have. Chisora cuts off the ring on you in a hurry. If Andy can somehow solve the foot speed gap, and it's possible, right? He just has to figure out the rhythm of it. In other words, the other guy's over there. Andy needs to be able to just run over to a fighter who's outside of punching range for him. Right? If he ran after, if he was in shape, which he wasn't, and if he ran after Anthony Joshua in that rematch, that fight would have had a different dynamic. It's a bad visual. A shorter guy running after a bigger guy who's supposed to be the puncher who's moving away. If Andy can solve the foot speed gap, I believe he's just too strong and too much of a combination puncher for Alexander Usyk. I'd be curious to see what the odds are in that fight. Right? I think Andy Dylan White's an interesting fight, folks. Dylan White doesn't move that well. Right now, Dylan White is offensively gifted. Right? Great jab. He's two-handed. Can knock you down with either hand. He's very good to the body. But I got to tell you, if your goal is to land body punches on Andy Ruiz, you're in trouble. Dylan White doesn't have, and is not going to have, Andy Ruiz's hand speed. Right? Understand, Andy is a problem because of the hand speed. Right? If a fight breaks out, not a distance boxing match where Dylan White is controlling the action with his jab, but if an actual fight breaks out between Andy Ruiz and Dylan White in the pocket, I think Ruiz has the advantage because Ruiz hits as hard as Dylan White, in my opinion, and is faster than Dylan White. Also, because Ruiz is a little bit shorter than Dylan White or fights shorter than Dylan White, bends over a bit, 
I think Andy would be able to protect his body better. Right? So, let's just say Andy Ruiz is a guy to keep an eye on at heavyweight. Right? If you talk with enough people, you're going to find out that there's a serious split on whether Joseph Parker beat Andy Ruiz when they fought for the heavyweight title. Right? The public has Ruiz wrong. They don't realize that Ruiz's fight against Joshua was his second shot at the heavyweight title. Right? This guy is dangerous in a pot shotting heavyweight division. This guy's a hard hitting, faster handed combination puncher. If he just gets the rhythm of moving his feet more, so he can cut off the ring quicker, so he can actually chase down clunkier, taller fighters who are moving away from him, then this guy has a serious chance to be king. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.